welcome you into worship today on this beautiful summer Sunday. A few of you were here in time for the surprise that God sent us. I was called away from my donut downstairs with the information that someone needed a pastor immediately. Much to my surprise, it was not a tragedy or a health crisis that caused somebody to come to St. Matthew and ask for a pastor. Instead, it was an entire row of bicycle riders who are on their way as part of the rag bri and decided they wanted to stop here and ask us to bless them. They brought with them a small bottle of holy water. I called those of you who were already gathered in the entry outside with me. We were able to pray with them, bless them with that sacred symbol of water, and then we all joined hands and prayed the Lord's Prayer. And as we begin to pray, the bells from the steeple started to chime. We literally could not pray more loudly than the bells were sounding to bless their trip from this place. They talked to us about stopping again on their next journey. Are there prayer concerns in addition to those that are printed for you? Carolyn's son-in-law and his first name is? John. Heart concerns in California. Other prayer concerns? Adele. A small child named Eric. Heart problems has been in Iowa City and now is back in Dubuque. Other prayer concerns? At the bottom of the front page of the announcements, that reminder that we need to speak again, semi-annual meeting here, Sunday, July 22nd, following worship. Not congregational voting, but rather an information sharing and an update about the state of the church. In addition to those, announcements that you see in the bulletin. Are there some things that you have brought in to announce yourselves? There is one correction, Sunday, July 22nd, the Dubuque Rescue Mission Dinner, having previously made plans, Bob Crayer discovered that they are now serving at noon. So that will limit some of the people if our annual meeting runs on, and it will also make it important for Emmanuel to leave their worship service early. So if anyone would be free to come on board for serving the Dubuque Rescue Mission Dinner next week at noon, we already have contributions and the food planned, but we could still use some help. Please stand. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent in your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and in the name of Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Let us join in our gathering hymn. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <clears throat> Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. the day. O oh God, from you come all the holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from all the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Would the children please join me? That house 
is going to be safe and sure for the family that lives in it. Here's some people that are living in this Bible house. Here's some people that are living in God's house. God builds you from real earthen material. Flesh and blood. God gave to you a spirit. God gives to your homes a spirit and to God's house a spirit. God wants to make sure that it measures up to God's standards of caring to keep you safe and keep you happy. In Jesus' name, thank you. First lessons from the book of Amos. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from, the, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Please join in reading the psalm responsibly. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and he will make a path for his steps. Through the Eyes of Youth today leads us into our second lesson from Ephesians, and it could be titled, Biting into Faith at the Food Court at the Mall. A reporter for a Christian family magazine wanted to know whether youth leave church with anything. And he decided that the best thing to do was ask youth, where do you feel faith with strength in your life? 
One of the interviews was with a young man who had grown up in the church, had been taught everything about the Bible, church doctrine, came from a family that was thrilled to come into God's house each week, but the youth explained that there came a moment when his faith was made alive, not at his church home, not at his family home, but at his second home, the mall. He said he was seated at the food court and he was filled with a sense of despair and loneliness. He said, in that moment, I opened my mouth and I bit into a chicken salad sandwich and suddenly faith came alive for me. He said it tasted like the chicken salad my grandmother made at church. It made me aware, he said, that Jesus was my companion in that place. No one else was sitting with me, but Jesus was there. Today, the second lesson comes from Ephesians, and we are reading it in God's house. Hopefully, youth carry something out from worship into the world wherever they feel at home. The second lesson today says that we have become children of God. Through a process of adoption, children who can bite into the faith of certainty. For God has come to dwell with us. The second lesson is from the book of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasures of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. So that we, who were first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Word of God, word of life. The Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men 
who arrested John bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. So she went out, and she said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head in a platter, gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. That was some birthday party. Can we gain anything by remembering it, let alone actually wondering about the meaning of it for us? This is a nice summer Sunday. We're here in this lovely, safe church home. This is a respectable gathering. We're in polite company. Birthday party, beheading. The two don't seem to go hand in hand with our own experience. And yet tragedies and all the troubles short of tragedies do so often happen in house. My family had one auntie who liked to drink, especially on birthdays. She'd roll down the driveway of Grandpa's farm, and she'd swerve behind the wheel of the car she drove in, and then she'd stagger out of the car and into the farmhouse, and she'd give you a great big kiss. My folks wanted to protect us from that kind of behavior. But she was our auntie. She was family. You've heard of the expression, with Notre Dame at least, about fighting Irish? Well, my husband's family was fighting Irish Catholic. There was always a row between a couple of them every time the family got together. And one year, they had a wonderful party that was too big for anybody's house. So they held it at church. Big turnout, great food, and then one cousin threw another cousin right through a stained glass window. The next day, nobody could remember exactly why. The priests and the nuns and the elders in the family, they were all very calm about it. And that did not make sense to me as a Protestant. Thank the Lord, they said, it was just a small panel. Nobody went through a great big stained glass window. And the family also had an attitude of forgiveness and inclusion. They said, boys will be boys. And since those boys were parochial schoolboys, there was a family tradition in place. At church and at school, if your kids broke it, you bought it. When families gather, blood is thicker than water. Sometimes blood boils, 
and even spills. Today is the birthday of Harry Blewett Jr. And I know that his birthday party last night was nothing like King Herod's party that included a dancing girl and a beheading. I hope your family events are warm and wonderful. But there is a pretty good chance that on occasion, people do come together in your home or a relative's house because there has been some bad news that you shared, not good news. I know that there have been times under your roof, between your walls, when tears have spilled over and anger has flared and hearts have been broken and your memories as well as your hopes have been left bruised by the assaults of intense intimacy. We act out in our words as well in our ways. The gospel for today is recorded in Mark chapter 6, and it is ghastly. Why? Open the Bible to this particular reading today. I do believe we gain something in the process of considering it. Despite our dreams, despite our devoted attempts, family living includes all forms of human interaction, and endings as much as beginnings happen under the roof of the family home. And within your home, you accept your failures as well as celebrate your success. Mark 6, King Herod throws himself a party his wrongfully acquired wife, who's also his sister-in-law, sends her little girl, who's also his niece and maybe his daughter or his stepdaughter, depending on which translation you read. The mother sends the little girl in to dance for a group of partying men. What kind of mother was she? And realistically, that little girl probably did not dance, ballet, or tap. It was some kind of crowd pleaser, closer to what we might call lightly hoochie-coochie. Talk about a family in dysfunction. So King Herod is carried away with high-spirited appreciation. Now, in a perfect world, he would be a father or an uncle who was applauding with parental pride the success of the little girl who's dancing. But Herod has already been what today's social scientists would call triangularized with the mother and the kid. And Herod boasts in front of these gentlemen that he can give the kid the moon. And she runs back to mama and mama manipulates the child to get revenge for every insult that woman has ever endured. So before the palace janitor sweeps up the crumbs of Herod's birthday cake, before the last birthday guests drag themselves out into the night air, Jesus has lost his cousin. John has lost his head. Herod and Herodias have lost the eloquent voice of a prophet who was calling them to come back to God come back to goodness, lead lives of integrity and purpose. But most tragically of all, at that birthday party, that little dancing girl lost forever her innocence. Would she ever forget the vengeance, the bloodlust, in which the elders in the family ensnared her? Within that child's soul must have remained forever a haunting image of a trophy awarded her by the king, the prophet's head. What do you think about that biblical birthday bash? I like birthday parties. I learned to like them at home. Swedish kids are taught that one day every year, God wants us to celebrate ourselves. We get to be the center of attention. We have come as gifts to our family 
and to the world. And I continue to look forward to having birthdays. I don't care that it means growing up and growing old. That's a small price to pay for believing that every year I open the gift of myself. And I'm pleased to see within the wrappings what God has sent me this year. As a child, I learned about life at friends' birthday parties. And I learned even more when I was not invited to birthday parties. And I was left alone to wonder why other children were invited and I was excluded from the invitation. And it created something within my heart that invites everybody as an adult. Through the years, people have asked me, why did you marry the man you married? And I tell them the truth. I married Jim because of his birthday party. Not that I attended it, but he told me about it. He was a teenage kid, big inner city, Newark, New Jersey. His father had died when he was only six months old. He was the youngest of five. He got himself a job, and as a teenager, he threw himself a birthday party for his friends. The pizzas were delivered, and the friends never came, not one of them. Jim explained how it was as the pizzas grew cold. He decided to throw them in the trash, and he cried himself to sleep that birthday. That touched my heart. I believed that God would grow from an experience like that a man of compassion and courage. What we know about intensity, we learn at home, our own, somebody else's, or God's house. And Mark 6 describes something that we do know about and need to care about. When family and friends come together, they carry in not only birthday gifts, but the baggage of history and needing and yearning. So our gospel today evokes awareness that togetherness inevitably includes times of confrontation, of disillusionment, of blows that are exchanged to our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. But over the past few weeks, if you've been reading the Gospel of Mark, you know that Mark has also offered us Jesus as the one who insisted that he came to give the world a new definition of family. A new definition of family. And as the Church of Christ, we have the opportunity to believe that we come into God's house as it is a safe house. And here we can practice our words and our ways in relationships. We can genuinely, sacredly connect. Would you open, please, to the hymn of the day? 641. Marty Haugen wrote it. It has a theme about building a house where all are welcome. Open to 641, and at this point, we'll all become the sermon. Stay, wait, wait one second. Remain seated, please, until the last verse. We'll sing the first verse, and then we'll pray an intercessory prayer about that verse, and then we'll move on with the images and the movements and the meaning of faith.
let us pray. Builder God, we praise you for living in places within our world, including this, our beloved church home. Shore up the foundations, strengthen the walls, from basement to belfry. Claim this space for your purposes and redecorate your house with reverence and righteousness for the sake of all who gather, one family of faith. Lord, in your mercy. I call your attention to some things in God's house that God's house has in common with your own house. There's going to be somebody here who will shake their finger at you and remind you not to track mud in on God's carpet. There are beautiful dishes here that we don't use for everyday snacking, but save for the sacrament at God's table. God's house has furniture, and you're not permitted to put your feet up on them. We ask that you don't snooze off while anyone is speaking to you. Here we have some cozy handmade blankets, just like you probably wrap up in at home. But God's house also has the supreme symbols of tradition. And in God's house, we cherish rituals. Let us sing together verse 2. Let us pray. God, we would become opening chapters in your word of life. We ask for your endurance and your courage to carry those crosses you have assigned to us. Lord, in your mercy. God's house has sacraments, blessed and served, but your house also has sacramental moments. When mercy and grace wash away the traces of sin and grief, as people are met at your table at home by the provisions of a loving Lord. Beneath the baptismal font here is a photograph of Karen's children and grandchildren. They are swimming, immersed in a pool the family just built together. Family faith is a combination of formal and traditional habits together with some very simple fresh, homemade moments. Let us sing together verse 3. Let us pray. Lord, we pray today for all who are without a faith home, for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Allow us, Lord, to become inviters that all might find an open door and a place of welcome. Lord, in your mercy. Displayed here are photographs about the ministries of your church. The fourth verse, when we sing it, will long for reaching beyond the wooden stone of this place into the world. In the photos you see, St. John's, with whom we are working in the guest house outreach ministry.
the Maria House, just a few blocks from us, where Christians work together to offer women and kids more than shelter, to connect them with programs to move beyond crisis to stability. There's the Habitat for Humanity House. This year's shared effort is an effort to move the house you built last year to a new location. It's been moved. The Multicultural Family Center is located downtown and our gifts are helping this summer with programs for youth. There's a picture of faces of folks that walked with the crop walk when your gifts were offered to feed the community and beyond it the world. And then there's the thermometer for the apples for students. Last week, a generous gift was delivered from here. And now St. Mark's Community Center will put school supplies into the hands of tomorrow's learners. Let us sing together verse 4. Let us pray. Lord, direct all who would be serving others, grant them a spirit of humility after Christ's example, that they may lift up those who have fallen and touch with healing those who are weary and fevered with illness. Move to generosity those with ample resources that needs might be met and the world might rejoice because of the sincere compassion of God's people. Lord, in your mercy. Please stand and sing the last of the verses, and after that we will declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us proclaim from floor to rafters the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy